As the last line in our life story, wills bring a special central meaning. They're not just about the possessions that we pass along. These final documents can bring people together, confuse heirs, and tear families apart. Those who leave nasty and manipulative wills understand that it's not just about passing along money. Take, for example, the man in Germany who, <clears throat> in his will, asked that his wake be held on the second story of his house. Well, before he died, he, saw through, he sawed through the beams in that second story. And so when hit the mourners, his friends and family gathered around the coffin, the weight made the floor collapse. He committed murder with his will. Many of the people died. What did he understand about the power of wills? Or then there was the fellow in Toronto who left a very creative and manipulative will. He left in the 1920s his considerable estate to the woman in the area who would have the most children in the next 10 years. Four women tied at nine children each, and sadly, two missed out. They'd had 10 each, one because she had two stillbirths, and another because she had her children out of wedlock. What did the creator of the great Toronto Stork Derby understand about the power of these final documents? Then there's Wellington Burt, one of the eight richest men in the United States at the time of his death in 1919. He was a timber baron. He left tiny amounts in the low thousands to his children and in unequal amounts. And the bulk of his estate he left for his descendants 21 years after his last grandchild would die. Well, what he managed to do was destabilize his family for generations. This will endured. There were more than 40 lawsuits. He brought out the worst in uh, his family for nearly 100 years. And it was no wonder then that the youngest heir called the will a curse. Now, we, uh, the more common destructive wills are those of people who disinherit their children. Uh, what is it that those parents know about controlling from the grave with a closed fist, also called dead hand control? In the United States, we allow more dead hand control than in almost any developed country in the world. For example, in Poland or the Czech Republic, you can only disinherit an adult child if that child attempts to murder you or succeeds in doing so. <laughs> now, <clears throat> we have to heal from these intentionally destructive wills, but they can teach us about the power of purpose and intent. Those of us who wish to leave a loving legacy can harness this power and increase the sense of connection, of belonging, of support that we offer to heirs, aiming for what Jews might call shalom bayat, or peace in the house. Now, how do we do that? The first thing we need is empathy. And we might define empathy as the ability to imagine what someone might be thinking, what someone might be feeling, and to care about those thoughts and feelings. Now, one of the problems that we face is how difficult it is to picture a world without us in it. Still, many people do leave loving wills that treat people fairly, and even in the extension to the community with philanthropic wills. And yet, there can be a feeling of, is this all there is? And there is something more. It is ethical legacy wills. 
And ethical legacy wills, also called ethical wills or legacy letters, are not legal wills. What they offer is a written account, could be a video account, and we can talk about our past, stories from our lives. We can discuss the present values and beliefs that we have. And then we can look to the future and give our blessings and hopes and tributes. For example, in one Ethical Legacy Wills workshop I taught, there was a woman who wrote about her childhood. And her <clears throat> mother worked two or three jobs at a time, and the only time they had together was in the morning before this woman went to school. And the mother would come in and braid beautiful ribbons in her daughter's hair. And it was a sign of the love and connection that they shared. Fast forward to when the woman had a daughter of her own. And the mother, now grandmother, came to live with her daughter and granddaughter. And once again, braided beautiful ribbons in her granddaughter's hair. How wonderful to give the creative gift of this story with a box of ribbons. A story that talks about the enduring connections. In my own case, I experienced an ethical legacy will that showed me that you don't have to wait till you're dead to give one. When I was 18 and away at college for the first quarter, my mother wrote me a letter for my birthday, about four pages single-spaced. And in it, she talked about the months leading up to my birth, my birth, what was happening in the world at the time, and the first few months of my life. And then she moved to talk about what strengths she saw in me and what she treasured in me, and she gave me her blessings. Well, when I received this letter, I thought I had the strangest mother ever. <laughs> But I carried that letter around with me until it disintegrated and I'd memorized it. When my own son turned 18, I wrote him a letter, and I followed my mother's structure, marveling at her insight about, how, about what to say. I talked about her letter. Her name was Rebecca, the Rebecca letter. I discussed the time leading up to his birth, his birth, the first few months of his life, what was happening in the world, and then I talked about what I treasured in him, what strengths I saw, and gave him my blessings. Well, my letter was also four or five pages, and when I handed it to him on the afternoon of his 18th birthday, he said, what's this, an essay I have to read? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, nope, you can wait till I'm dead, that's fine, it's up to you. And so he uh, sat down and he read the letter, and I watched as a tear went down his cheek. Then he put the letter away in his room, came back, gave me a hug, and said, thanks a lot. Now I have to write my kids' letters when they <laughs> turn 18. <laughs> and I was thrilled, because the Rebecca letter would live on. Right now, it was in his imagination with imaginary kids, but I knew that he would take it with him, that the, what she had started would endure. You don't have to write uh, pages or a book or, to make a difference. In one, another of my Ethical Legacy Will workshops, we did a short 10-15 minute exercise with a tribute. And one woman wrote about her nephew and how much she appreciated his companionship, his helping her move, and his wonderful peach pies. And in doing so, she did something dramatic. Because so often we talk about what we, or think about, what do we want people to say about us in our obituary or in our memorial service? And instead, she turned it around and talked about him, uh, focusing on him, focusing on what she had to say to him, not with a closed fist, but with an open hand. Now, the most powerful will in our time 
oddly came because of an obituary, really an obituary gone wrong. Alfred Nobel, the uh, inventor of the prizes, was living in France at the time his brother died. Now, Alfred also was the inventor of dynamite. And when his brother died, the French newspaper confused Alfred and his brother. So he opened up the paper to the headline, The Merchant of Death is Dead. And partly in response to seeing this uh, view of him, he created a new will. But he didn't believe in lawyers. And so he just wrote a couple of pages, handwritten, and each prize doesn't even get a sentence of his own, its own, it's just a phrase. And in that will, he set up the prizes. Now, the problem came when he died, and he had estates in five different countries. And in those countries, none of those countries wanted to carry out his will. Finally, Sweden agreed because he kept horses on his estate there. They decided that meant he intended to move back. But it still took years more of arguing with extended family members. Sweden was upset. They didn't want the prizes to go around the world. And finally, five years after Nobel's death, his will was enacted. It, it, the, the will was a mess. And yet, in setting up those prizes and creating the uh, Nobel Peace Prize, what he did, whether we agree with who receives the prizes or not, was give the whole world a value that peace is the greatest honor that you can achieve. Shalom by it, peace in the house, writ large. Now, we don't have to uh, leave our own legacies in a perfect way. But purpose and intent does matter. First, we need to heal from those intentionally destructive wills, and almost every family has a difficult will to deal with. Then we might integrate those loving legacies that we've received. And then we can ask ourselves some questions. What have I given during my time here on Earth? What am I giving now? What will I leave behind? And how can I do that with an open hand?